The thoughts and opinions on Just Some Podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent the views of organizations that employ them or they volunteer for. They are also not responsible for spontaneous black holes or nuclear wars that may occur. You have been been warned. The award-winning podcast that's never won an award. Downloaded and listened to around the world. Join the conversation on our social media. An educational experience that'll make you laugh. You're listening to Just Some Podcast. And here's your host. Ben and Tom. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another fun-filled and exciting episode of Just Some Podcast. This is Tom. Hey, this is Ben. Tom, bud, I know we talked a little bit in pre-production, but how was your week? (laughs) Uh, Well, first, can I say I don't like... Strep or flu. Uh, yeah. 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 That's that sums up my work week. Uh the tsunami of patients. Like up to my ass in influenza patients, yeah. Roger that. And then I do love the occasional really odd one in the middle, like I've been having left ear pain for three years. What? Like where huh? How come what? No, so I've that's been, a. I've been dizzy for uh, two years, and I need you to fix it today. Literally had that happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, not literally that, but something very similar. And I, I just kind of sat there. I was like, mm, I'm not. That's the only answer there is. But I here, I, I want to go on a tiny side rant about insurance companies. Now we talking uh, like. Health insurance, uh, car insurance. Well, insurance. let's let's just say insurance in general can blow okay. me. <laughs> but in this particular case, we're going to talk about a small situation with property insurance. Which, by the way, this this seems to be the same scenario. Different facts, clearly, but health insurance is no different. Car insurance is no different. At some point, we as a people around the United States, because the other countries don't seem to have this issue, we need to revolt against insurance company. That's my only thought. But so my house was damaged by a storm. That's why I have insurance. Right. Yeah. So did all the estimates and all sort of stuff. And well, long story short, it's like. They don't want to pay for anything other than I, the, the bare minimum, which I understand their business. But at some point, I'm like, what am I doing paying you if there's some issues involved? And I mean, some of it I understand, but some of it is so, well, it, it, did you read your uh, your homeowner's policy? I'm like, what? Like, no, something bad happened and I pay you to fix those bad things. And now you don't want to fix those things. So it's like in the analogy, and I know I told you this pre-production, but the analogy seems pretty apt to me, which is if my house burnt down because a toaster malfunctioned, they would want to replace the toaster and then tell me that the rest of the house burning down wasn't their responsibility because they replaced the malfunctioning toaster. Yeah, you're going to have to go after the uh, toaster manufacturer to uh, replace the rest of that stuff, but we will gladly replace that toaster with one of equal or lesser value. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, that's, you know, between getting my ass handed to me at work, and I love, the thing is, is I love the staff I work with, and I love taking care of patients, but, wow, it is mentally draining to deal with flu season. It is. It is just, It and this something. isn't even the worst one. Last year was even worse. Like, yeah. One of the things I was reading, and it was when I was still newer to ER, was the worst flu epidemic they had had in whenever, for however long they recorded it. I want to say it was 2012. I am not 100% sure about that. 
But I was reading stories about the bigger cities like Boston, New York City. They were actually keeping doctors like overtime to qualify the MSEs, the medical screening exam for the people out there that don't know what an MSE is, to just basically walk out to waiting rooms and be like, what's your name and date of birth? Okay, you're fine. Go home. Like, that's how they were just like, no, you're fine. Go home. No, you're fine. Go home. Okay, you stay. No, no, you're fine. Go home. Because they had that many people like, I think it was New York Presbyterian. I'm not 100%. They said there was like a six hour wait time to get into the waiting room. That's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's not really God. People, people just standing out in the street, taking numbers to take a number to get into triage. Like, wow, that's, that's pretty, pretty effing bad. And you know what the death rate and all that other stuff was from my understanding? None or not none, but like nothing unusual, but everybody thought they were sick. It's like now serving number four and I have <laughs> number 1,260. I was thinking of that scene in Beetlejuice yes. when he's in the death waiting room. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. It's like 19. He looks up. It's like, <laughs> or he's got like number one million two hundred thirty six, and it's like nineteen. He's yeah. like, Ugh. <laughs> but anyways, life shouldn't all be about complaining. So I, I am sure at some point I will find something to be happy about. It's I'm happy about being on this podcast and recording it and being on Helium Radio Network. There you go. Ooh. See what I just did there? I did see what you did there. Yeah. See, but yeah, like you, man. It's just. You know, I got back from my trip that I took, that I talked about last week, and my first day back, I think of the 30-plus patients that I've seen, 18 were positive for influenza, and just hasn't stopped. I mean, it's just been every damn day. Flu, 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 yeah. random stuff, like you said. <laughs> yeah. Flu, 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 and we're seeing a lot of flu and strep together, like... The patient's testing positive for both flu and strep. I'm like, oh, you poor kid. Like, I feel bad for you because that's a shitty, shitty yeah. diagnosis, you know? Yeah. That, that's the uh, the hammer <laughs> when you get both of those together. But uh, we have seen a few doubles, um, not quite near as many. But it is, I think, for some reason, it seemed in our area to start much later. Like, everybody else is like, oh, we're getting flus. And I was like, well, we're not. Yeah. And then, pow. <laughs> we got a bunch. It Drop was incredible. Hammer. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, the reason I was going to say, the reason I'm griping is because I am sure I am not the only person that feels like that. So to everybody else out there that is just struggling in this deep dive, I am sure that we will get out of it. We will. And we are going to be just that much better at our profession with the experience that we are gaining now, and I'm trying desperately to see that positive spin at the end of this. So, if if you are out there listening currently and you're sick of flu season, raise your hand. If unless you're driving, don't. If you're driving, don't. Do that. Yeah, don't. Do I just want to see people out oh, there. they are like raising their hand. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can put them down now. The funny thing is, is I know one person in particular that always listens to us on their drive because that's what they tell us. And I could just see him wrecking his truck. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not either because he'll definitely blame us. But it's not our fault if you take your hands off the wheel while driving. So, But what we will do is we will replace your podcast with one of equal or lesser value. <laughs> Yes, I will give you a new episode of this podcast. That's amazing. Look at you. Can you believe the the deal we're making right there? It's incredible. Ah, so Ben, let's before I because honestly, I, I I don't think we're I don't think I'm alone. I think you're in the same boat. I think literally the couple thousand people that came to this podcast with us, or thousands of downloads that came with us to this podcast, and now the new. Helium Radio Network listeners, I am sure there are plenty of people out there that feel just like us. So uh, we're going to make it through. So let's yep. move on because otherwise I will sink into this pit of despair Even and you. never get us out of it. So let's uh, let's do stories we missed. Well, before we do stories we missed, let's do social media. Oh, my God. You know, I knew you would bring that up. You know why? Because I know you love doing it. I do love it. So it's do. my favorite part of the show. 
You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at Just Some Podcast. You can find us on the web, www.justsomepodcast.com. Email us. Tell us you hate flu season two. Admin at justsomepodcast.com. As Tom has alluded to also, we are also on Helium Radio Network. Helium Radio After Dark. Thursdays, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central. Tom, what else can they do? Well, first of all, they can give us some ratings and reviews on any of those sites. They can tell all their friends about us. Also, they can go to our website down at the bottom of the page. There's an affiliate link for Amazon. You click on that before you do any of your Amazon shopping. And then everything you purchase will give us some uh, proceeds so that we can put some money back into the show. It's free to you, and you won't even know we're there. So that's something we know a lot of you have been using, and we are totally appreciative of all the shopping you're doing. And I'm sure Amazon is, too. I'm sure they are, yes. Now you want to do stories we may have missed? Now can we do stories we missed? Yeah. This was actually one, because right now I have several students that I'm precepting with this semester, trying to help further educate future nurse practitioners and help better the profession. And, or create uh, competition in the job market. Yeah, either way, you know. I'm confident in my skills now. It's okay. Uh, but her and I had talked about the opioid epidemic and I said you know we had an episode or two on that and as we alluded to in those episodes we're going to go back and listen to them that's episode I believe 20 and 21 you know we talk about some of the four reasons that we felt like we're getting some of the opioid epidemic but Tom she found a story and it's it's about your favorite state what's your favorite state Tom it's my favorite state your favorite state to talk about (laughs) well geez there's so many at this point but I'll tell you one that's not it's not Oklahoma Oh, but that's where the story originates from, Tom. You should see my shocked face. So, the Oklahoma Attorney General's office... Does he want to indict Yetis or Sasquatch beef jerky? Yes. A shocker. Eventually. But, yeah. right now they're focusing on the opioid epidemic, and there's a trial set to begin in May. And this is going to be in regards to Purdue Pharma and OxyContin. But, they are saying, Tom... Not only are they going after Purdue, but they're going after the king pin that has fueled the country's opioid crisis. Do you know who that king pin is, Tom? Um, is it that one guy that works at the Starbucks at the corner of 8th and uh, Hydraulic? Because if it's that guy, I could feel it. Like, that guy gives me the, the stink eye every time I order my drink. Do they have beady little eyes? Yeah, something like that. Well, you're close. Very, very close. Only if his last name is Johnson, because the Oklahoma Attorney General's office is saying that Johnson and Johnson is the kingpin that has fueled the country's opioid epidemic. The guys that make baby powder? The guys that make baby powder. They're the kingpins of opiate drugs. So here are Oklahoma Attorney General. Uh, has asked the court to publicly release millions of pages of confidential documents that Johnson & Johnson submitted during the discovery phase. They, in the past, have produced raw narcotics in Tasmanian poppy fields, uh, and then they supplied those products to the opioid makers like Purdue Pharma. They apparently boasted to some of their investors on some slides that were obtained by this website that we're getting the news from, which is Axios, A-X-I-O-S. Slides were obtained from them that... They boasted at one time that their opium poppies enabled the growth of oxycodone because their morphine content of a different poppy was the highest in the world. And I did not know this, but Johnson & Johnson used to sell Nucenta and still currently sells Duragesic, which is a fentanyl patch that had uh, peak sales of $2 billion in 2004. Beyond that, the Oklahoma Attorney General's office is alleging that they targeted vulnerable populations including children and older adults, because they feel that they would get better response from them. And they also lobbied and funded groups that aggressively advocated for easy access to opioids. So let me see if I get this straight. Go ahead. And I'm going to use code names so that people don't get mad or try and sue us. Well, I'm just, so, reading, the, I'm just reading the news. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, inferring information here. Okay, so. co- code names. Yeah, code names. So group, person A... Is like, hey, I want to stop making baby powder, and, well, I'm going to keep making baby powder. Yeah. And I'm also going to cultivate some raw products and give them to persons B, C, and D so they can make medications with it. And then 
person's B, C, and D say, hey, I'm going to flat lie to prescribers in the public about the addictive nature of my medications. And then somehow the state of Oklahoma said, well, if person A hadn't given them the opium, they would have never been able to lie about how great it was. Well, I don't know so much that person B, C, and D are saying that about person A. I think that... No, no, no. I'm saying the state of Oklahoma is saying this. To an extent, yes. I think they're also saying that you know they were lying in con- congressional pockets to uh, promote easy access to opiates, which almost, I mean, if you think about this, Tom, the way I look at it, this is kind of like an M. Night Shyamalan like, twist. Like You would never suspect in the end of the movie that it was the baby powder. Exactly. Like... I remember all the times we used the lavender Johnson & Johnson baby lotion, and who really knew we were funding terrorist groups in opium fields? Now you know, Tom. Now you know. Or, and this is just a thought, somehow the pot smoke and squatching attorney general's office of Oklahoma has completely screwed this up, and they're going after the wrong people. Maybe that's what's going on. Well, they have documents to back it up, they say, and hopefully uh, the judge will be compelled to release some of those documents publicly so that we can see if they were as guilty or similarly guilty as Purdue. Well, or person my, B. Sorry, person, person my, B. <laughs> my counterpoint would be we're talking about Oklahoma. <laughs> Unless there's really big pictures on there, I'm not sure they understand what those documents actually say. Be nice to our people in Oklahoma. We do have a large listener base there. What? All three? What? What? what is, what's going on in Oklahoma? Look, if you're from Oklahoma, I am sure you understand the joke because yep. I'm from somewhere way better than there. So I, I'm sure they get it at some point, right? I mean, uh, at least they're not, you know, somewhere like Mississippi, for God's sakes. So hey, our, our uh, education... Sorry. <laughs> Minister of Education? I don't know. I like, I like education czar, I think. Is that what we said? I, you know, honestly, we called him administrator of education or something like that. Education administrator. Yeah. Well, we called him so many things lately. I don't know. I don't remember what the last thing it was. So I think it's hard we, to say. We'll get a star education. Okay. Well, we'll get so we'll get Sam the producer to make up a plaque or something and get that squared away as soon as possible. Write it in crayon. <laughs> <laughs> make make sure all the letters are nice and big. Use the big chief pad. Yeah. Make sure we get all that squared away. And since I and I I think this is really cool. I feel like since we have a lot of new listeners and some of you guys are outside of the United States, if you have questions what any of that means, please email us. I will be more than happy in detail to explain why that entire part of the story was hilarious. Like you're missing out if you don't understand what I'm talking about. What's the email address, Tom? at just a podcast so you admin. always do that part i never practice it so admin at just some podcast.com ad am i in at just some podcast.com but tom you so you've insulted the great uh great listeners of oklahoma you have uh i have called out baby powder you have defended baby powder i don't know if i defend baby powder hey. i just think it's horse shit so uh, okay We'll see what happens with the story. <laughs> Are you ready to jump and, in our main... Oh, go ahead. I am. I was just thinking. I was like, I kind of knew it was admin at just some podcast. I hope so. But for some reason, like when you put me on the spot, my, my brain just went, is it administration or admin? Like I could not remember. So I was like, <laughs> I just did that. And I was like, yeah, edit, edit admin it. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got the influenza. You ready to jump into the main topic, Tom? I am. I am ready to get into this. So we haven't even told everybody what it's about this week. Oh, good point. Well, go ahead. I thought, and when I first said this to Tom, he's he, he's like, okay, why? I said, let's cover gout. And Tom, why did I want to cover gout? He said for St. Patrick's Day, and trust me, the same puzzled look you have on your face while you're listening to this is the exact same puzzled look I had on my face. <laughs> so, I thought they went great together. St. Patrick's Day, gout. And yeah. because <laughs> what are Irish typically known for? Uh, beautiful poetry, amazing architecture. Alcohol. Oh, yeah, alcohol. 
Corned beef. And, and, oh, yeah, it's St. Patrick's Day, which is right around the corner. So, yeah, no, it, make, it makes more sense when you say it like that. Alcohol, corned beef, massive amounts of consumption. Yeah, I see where it took me a second, but I got there. I saw what you're saying. And at first, I didn't know if he was making fun of me because, again, I'm not afraid to make fun of myself on this show. I actually have gout. So Frequent. I was like, do you say that again? Frequently. <laughs> It's gotten a lot better now, and we're going to talk about this. So, well, we'll get into that in an episode. We'll get into an episode about uh, misdiagnosis. So we'll we'll get into that. So, um, fun fact, Tom. I know we talked about this, and I, you said you know it'd be great if we could mention this, or I think you said this. Maybe I'm dreaming shit. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you got the strip. Maybe. 130 to 185,000 people in Ireland may have gout, which is about 4% of the population. And they're saying about 1 in 20 may have gout. That Honestly, I, I didn't say that, but that is a very similar number. As a matter of fact, that's dead on to the same amount of Americans, 4%. Damn. Approximately 6 million men and 2 million women are affected by gout in America. Well, then that just kind of kills my... Uh, my hypothesis. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Don't thank me. Thank the Irish. All right. Well, why don't you get into it a little bit, Tom? Tell us what gout is, and we'll roll from there, buddy. Oh, I will be so happy to talk about this horrible, horrible affliction. I knew like, you would. You have a... Oh, my God. So, yeah, I... Just a quick illustration, and we're going to get into the stuff, the notes we actually have written down because we try and be professional and we try and be educational when we talk about stuff. But I will tell you right now, I used to be one of those guys, like when I heard the word gout, I thought of old men and Velcro shoes yeah. and shuffleboard and a guy going, ow. And I was like, it's not that big a deal, you know, incorrect. Got me a case of the gouts. Yeah, let me just so you know, if you're not afflicted with this and you're a practitioner or a physician, whatever, and you are providing care for someone that has gout, this is what I want you to do to go home, get a rubber mallet, and then crush every bone in your foot. <laughs> and then I want you to try and walk around for approximately two or three miles. That that is what an acute phase attack of gout <laughs> roughly feels like. I don't know why I'm laughing. This, I'm sorry. I, I know because you're imagining me hit myself in the foot with a hammer. Yeah. Uh, this is this is no joke. Um, and I don't know if this will make it past editing, but we'll find out. But <laughs> honestly, um, I remember during one gout flare up that. Not only could I not move because just everything caused pain, I literally had to tell my wife to turn off the ceiling fan because the air blowing on my foot was causing pain. Really? Wow. Yes. So, Tom, then I know that I have heard you reference something else that was quite painful to you. And so I've just, just from my own knowledge base, tell me which was worse. Taser? Gout. Oh, gout. Really? Wow. Oh, uh a thousand times so taser is incapacitating and it it is painful like i said it's like a thousand midget clowns hitting you at the same time it's that's what I, that's the sound but i was looking for i think <laughs> yes it's <laughs> it is to use a term it's exquisite is how painful a, a, a taser is okay but i will tell you right now gout will literally it alters everything when you're in a massive flare-up, and, and maybe I had a worse than usual flare-up, but it, it literally got to the point where I was contemplating if I could find a tourniquet and cut my foot off. Wow. that's I have never had gout. I've taken care of patients with it. I mean, very similar to kidney stones. I've never had a kidney stone you know, so, with it. it would, hold on. Point of order. Which, yeah, so which would you rate there? Worse there, Tom. <laughs> Nephrolithiasis or gouty arthritis? So, ooh, I like how you you threw that out there. I like that. Yeah. So I will tell you for the pain of the kidney stone for in the moment you're, you have it and it's traveling and you're trying to pass it, I would say the kidney stone. Okay. I would tell you the great difference is 
one, the gout lasts right. for days, and two, it comes back. And not that kidney stones can't, but the kidney stone is like, okay, I'm going to pass this, and then I'm through it, much like the taser. The gout, you know, like, oh, uh, like you get this sense of dread when you start to feel that pain, and it's like nausea over your entire body. Like you're like, oh, here it comes. And there's not in there's not a lot you can do. Like you can you could take some of the medications, you could try to get rid of some of the symptoms, but you know if that flare up takes hold, you're whatever you planned on for the next couple of days, stop. You're not doing it. So it's uh I, I would say gout is an extremely terrible disease, to be completely fair. Now, and this is one of the things we're gonna talk about, and that's one of the things we I'm glad we're doing this episode is with really good preventative measures and some self-care, you can really cut that down. And even if you have a flare-up at that point, they're very mild compared to when they're undiagnosed. So let's let's get into the specifics, all right? So gout is technically an inflammatory arthritis that develops with high levels of uric acid. Those uric acid, the uric acid, I should say those, the uric acid, will then form into needle-like crystals, which usually culminate in joints. Now, one of the things I will make sure to point out to people, because this is true of me, I'm one of the outliers, is the vast, vast, vast majority of gout attacks are going to begin or stay within the joint of the great toe of an affected foot, usually one-sided. There is a typical presentations, and I am one of them. I was actually told the very first time I had a gout attack that I had a sprained ankle. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, I. it was nowhere in my foot. It was nowhere in the ball of my foot. It was the lateral edge of my pinky toe up to the malleolus, and holy cow, it hurt, but it was... Like, okay, I, I sprained my ankle, and, and that made sense. And after a couple of days, it went away, and I was like, wow, okay, no big deal. But then it came back. <laughs> well, and, and so what I seen was about 90% have big toe involvement at some time. Can also yeah. be insteps and ankles are often involved. Uh, peak age is usually over the age of 50. So you're just a lucky one, Tom, <laughs> and predominantly male. I am lucky, predominantly male. And, and honestly, I'm willing to say this uh, piss poor diet. Bad diet. Uh, which is I used better. to consume a, used to which is a lot better. Uh, consumed a massive amount of alcohol, and you put those factors together and high stress. I, I just my body was like, okay, we'll slow you down. If you don't want to slow down, I'll slow you down. And so that's what happened. See why it ties into St. Patrick's Day? Yes, I <laughs> I do. It's 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 coming. It's becoming so clear now, Ben as to why we're doing this for St. Patrick's Day. So some of the diagnostic testing that we can do as practitioners to figure out if somebody has gout is joint fluid draws, blood, x-rays, ultrasounds, which are very common in Europe, but not so common in America, but hopefully we'll change that someday. I also saw one of the uh, resources, dual energy CT. Yeah, right. <laughs> Like, go ahead and get that cleared. <laughs> not here. Not without a yeah, prior op. That, yeah. yeah, exactly. That is not going to happen at all. For practitioners out there, this could resemble like a bacterial cellulitis because of the redness. Some, t- some attacks can last a couple of hours. Some can last a couple of weeks. And you may see you know, some systemic signs for acute gouty arthritis can sometimes include fever, uh, leukocytosis and the elevation of the sed rate. So, and I've had to explain to patients before that we're doing the uric acid level to look for arthritis or to look for gout. But the conference that I went to that I'm pulling a lot of information from, and I'll throw that information out when I get done with this, said that there can be bouts of gout and still in the acute phase still have a normal uric acid level yes i saw that on multiple websites that especially so there is something called the uh one of the very first stages so we'll get to the stages you know here in a second but there's an ace there can be an asymptomatic hyperuricemia and during that phase you either will have no symptoms but you can be building up the high uric acid and it gets to the point where as it's forming and it's crystals and 
for some reason it's not showing up in the blood. And I read that same thing. And I was just like, that is just odd. Yeah, like, I, I agree. Because that's like, I mean, that's what you learn is, here's what to look for, is if their their uric acid is elevated. And if it's not, then, and sometimes if it's a patient who has chronic gout, where they have acute flare-ups, like Tom, then I'm going to base a lot of my assessment on his systemic, or not his systemic, uh, I lost the word. Um, I got it now. So if it's somebody with chronic gout, damn it. Words are hard. Words are hard. I'm going to leave that in now because it's funny. Uh, (laughs) If it is somebody like Tom with chronic gout that has acute flare-ups, I'm going to use more of my subjective findings of kind of trust in his body. I mean, if he has felt gout 37 times and knows what gout is going to feel like, you know, I may not even do a a uric acid level at that point. I'm going to like, you know what, I'm going to look at it. It looks red. You're saying you have pain there. You're saying it felt like every time that you've had gout, okay, I'm probably going to be okay treating you for gout. Yeah, and and we'll get to acute treatment here in a minute. But one of the things I found, it was one of those aha moments because, again, like I said, I had a weird first case. Usually the very first attack is at night. Now, I can't find a why, but there is a specific reference to usually the very first acute flare-up will occur at night. And I will tell you, my very first flare-up woke me up from sleep and I actually woke my girlfriend up and said, take me to the emergency room. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but my foot feels like it's going to explode. I get to the emergency room, which I know is such a putz move. But, I mean, it's that level of pain. Like, I was like, my foot's going to explode. And we get out to the ER and they take some x-rays and they're like, yeah, you got a sprain. So that's how that's how I went down the O. And I said, but how did I sprain my foot in my sleep? At which point the ER physician said, well, maybe you did it earlier and it, it didn't have inflammation till now. I was like, oh, OK. And this is way pre me not having any medical knowledge. So I was like, well, he's a physician. He knows. So that's must have been what I did. And that's why the very first couple of flare ups I had, I was like, God, how did I sprain my foot again? <laughs> Speaking of, you said nighttime and that triggered something that I seen. Have you ever heard of the English? And this is. Uh, nobody recent, so let's just clarify that. <laughs> Have you heard of the English physician Thomas Sydenham? Was that in any of your literature that you found? I no, not a mark. Okay, English physician in the Journal of Clinical Rheumatology in August 2004, they had quoted one of his papers and the way he described gout. You ready for this? Tell me, oh, if, this as I can tell me if this doesn't sound eerily familiar to your experience, Tom. This was penned in 1683. The victim goes to bed in good health. About 2 o'clock in the morning, he is awakened by a severe pain in the great toe. The pain is like that of a dislocation, and yet the parts feel as if cold water is being poured over them. After a time, this comes to its full height, accommodating itself to the bones and ligaments of the tarsus and metatarsus. So exquisite and lively is the feeling of the parts affected that it cannot bear the weight of bedclothes. The night is passed in torture, turning off turning of the part affected and perpetual change of posture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say. That That is a, yeah, that's a really good explanation. So just keep that in mind when you guys get that patient that's like, I don't know what happened last night. All of a sudden, you know, my knee started hurting. My foot started hurting. Perhaps, you know, we should go apart that. And since we're still technically on diagnosis, let's go over that. You need to touch what's hurting all right so like when you're doing your physical exam you need to be dealing with that patient you're going to feel extreme heat all right i mean every there's going to be variances between other people but it's going to be much warmer and much redder than the surrounding tissue and it's going to be in a joint space or around the joint space and it's going to be painful like even if it's not as red even if it's not as swollen even if it's not whatever that patient is going to let you know, please stop touching. <laughs> and that should be one of the cardinal signs that, hey, perhaps, because I want to, you know, we talked, it can be other places. I have a atypical presentation, but you can get it in your knee and you can get it in your wrist. Like it can form in any joint space. It does 90% of the time, as Ben said, present in your great toe. But that's not meaning 
That does not mean blah, 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 words are hard. That does not mean that will be the only place that will attack. So don't get tunnel vision. If you're, I'm not saying don't assume cellulitis or go down that path, but you need to start keeping those factors in mind when you're making your diagnosis. What did you find, Tom? Kind of moving on slightly. What did you find about comorbidities and gout? Because I have some information here on that. Oh, I got plenty of that. Hold on a second. Uh, what, tell me if this sounds similar to what you have. Patients with gout tend to have an average of four comorbidities, and up to 10% of patients with gout can present with up to seven or more comorbidities, including things like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, and diabetes. So most of the articles actually, it referenced that, but it broke it down more as risk factors. Okay. As so, some of the risk factors are genes. You know, do you have family members with this condition? Then, similar to the comorbidities that you already put out, including diabetes and heart disease. Meds. Here's a big one, and here's one of the things that we don't think about. We can be causing either the gout-like symptoms to get worse or to increase your chances of your patient developing gout. Diuretic medications for hypertension. And immune suppression medications are the two big ones for developing gout. So just be aware if you put your patient on HCTZ, this needs to be a conversation about things that they need to watch for. The patient's diet, red meat, shellfish, two of the big ones. I have been lucky, again, since, you know, just information, since I have a microphone so I can talk as much as I want. (laughs) Red meat doesn't actually bother me. Of course, I'm also on a preventative medication, which we're going to cover, but red meat doesn't seem to bother me. But if I eat shrimp, my foot explodes. And that is one of the great failures of my body because I love shrimp. So not being able to eat it is terrible. Gender, men are more likely than women until the age of 60. And the reason being is they believe that the hormone estrogen helps protect women before that. Alcohol consumption, soda consumption, consumption because of high corn fructose, obesity, and bypass surgery. I have no clue why bypass it just says bypass surgery. I wonder if it's because they're not breaking down some of those dietary aspects like the purines. and. Well, purines, yes, uh, high purine content is going to be. But what I'm saying is I, it didn't specifically break it down in the article. Like everything else was like, oh, well, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then it just said bypass surgery. (laughs) I was like, what the hell? (laughs) Like it just throws that out there. But yeah, so those are some of the definite things. And you can't forget smoking, Tom. Yeah. Well, if if you could find me one thing, (laughs) um, what was it? There is one thing. It was a bladder cancer. It helps. I I think if I remember right, because I remember this from nursing school. It was one of those like, oh, there's finally one thing that's smoking. It helps. It does not prevent you from getting bladder cancer. As a matter of fact, I think it can be a cause, but it's one of the things they think can help prevent it from getting worse. Like spread is smoking. I don't remember the exact. Sam, the producer was in that class. He can help me. So let's let me go over the stages and then we can go back over. So you get gout, right? We, we talked about some of the risk factors, some of the diagnosis. So let's talk about the stages of gout. So we talked about the asymptomatic and then you have the acute gout attack. And that is something triggers a spike in the uric acid. It collects usually at night. We talked about that. Symptoms will start to ease over a couple of days. 60% of people afflicted with gout or have that a first acute gout attack. We'll have a second one within the first year. 84% will have another flare up within three years. Damn. So once you get the gout, you yeah. got the gout. You got the gout. And unless the uh, ER physician tells you it's a sprain, so you keep eating shrimp and beer <laughs> like it's going out of style, and you keep going, why does my foot keep hurting? <laughs> you may have more attacks than just one in three years. So Let's there's keep always that. It and I don't know how. <laughs> Yes, it was amazing. I was like, I'm not even running. How do I keep spraining this ankle? <laughs> After the acute, there is what is called the interval, which is the time between. And honestly, if you know you have that first attack, this is when they recommend self-care and prevention, which we're going to cover here in a second. And then you go into the chronic, which is when you start developing flare-ups throughout the rest of your life. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's one of those things that once you start having it it's not going anywhere it's not going anywhere anytime soon i'll tell you that right so 
Ben, we've talked about how to diagnose it. We've talked about some of the things that practitioners can look for while they're having a patient with these complaints and the stages. So why don't we start talking about actual treatment? I mean, that might be helpful at some point. Well, I know you talked about some prevention. I know you want to go over some other stuff, but conference that I attended, he had a slide that was basically called, you know, avoiding high purine foods. And so he listed a lot of those. And a lot of these that kind of surprised me. Well, it would be helpful to avoid the things causing gout. Right, which makes so sense. Why, why, yeah, so why don't we talk about that? Uh, so foods that can contain very large amounts of purine, yeast, herring, mussels, and smelt. 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 <laughs> large amounts of purine, anchovies, codfish, bacon, pheasant, salmon, turkey, veal, and then moderate amount, bass, lobster, crab, asparagus, spinach, which I found kind of interesting, lima beans, and shrimp. So yours is even just a moderate amount of purine, unless you eat just an extensive amount of it, which they're called shrimp well, for a reason, I guess. So, <laughs> Well, and I will say this. This is my experience, and the few patients I've helped treat with this. I don't – you. these are good guidelines for diet and understanding what's going on, but I will tell you right now, I have had plenty of veal – uh, asparagus, spinach, uh, turkey, etc. No problems. Uh, red meat, no problems. But I can I can have like one beer and I get a little antsy, like oh my god, am I gonna do it? But if I have like a shrimp in my mouth, like I don't even think I've started digesting it, my foot starts hurting. Like it's I don't know what it is. I don't know why. I know it's a moderate amount, but I will tell you, I think. That's one of the things to keep in mind when you're helping your patient figure this out is when they figure out what their triggers are, they need to avoid those at all costs. And not everybody's going to have. It's good to say, here's the guidelines. Here's what we know. But you're going to have to figure out exactly what's causing it because mine are not the same as that list. So I think what we need to do with you personally <laughs> is okay. we need to feed you muscles, smelt, and then several beers and just see if your foot explodes <laughs> okay so muscles i will absolutely do there is no way i'm eating anything called smelt <laughs> okay so that's that's done you don't even bother yeah beer sure you get me some uh Hofbrau House beer and we'll yeah we'll, we'll try it out i know i can have a couple I've had I've I've gone out on a limb a couple times at, at dinner and someone goes, oh, you know, I got this beer and I'm like, OK, you know, I'll try one. And my wife always looks at me like you're a moron. So that's that's like literally I'm doing air quotes. That's what her eyeballs say. I don't want to hear your shit later on. You're a moron. <laughs> that's what her eyeballs say to me. <laughs> and I'm not saying she's she's not wrong. Right. I'm just, you know, but I guess it's one of those things like we can spit off these facts to people and we can spit these facts off to our patients. But I, I'm trying to reinforce this as a patient with this. Not everyone's going to be that. Right. Like, you know, you can say, well, I know there's a lot of people that they're by the book people and they're going to go, nope, you can't have hamburgers. Well, they might be able to or they might be able to once they're on preventative medications. But I, even with preventatives, I'm telling you right now. You take me to Red Lobster on, on Endless Shrimp Night, and I'm going to punch you in the jimmy. I'm telling you right now, it's not going to happen. So, uh, so Because you're not going to walk away from so Shrimp we, Night, but you're going to pay for it later. Yeah, exactly. So like when I'm sawing my foot off with a hacksaw, I'm sawing your foot off with a hacksaw. So that's how this is going to work. What are some other treatment options, Tom? So let's talk about the, the two things that we need to be aware of okay so there's treatment for the acute attack and then there's prevention the long term right. so in the acute phase the first line are, are insets okay your ibuprofens and aproxins i will tell you very popular and very helpful is indomethacin i think i've heard that from other patients too yeah yes indomethacin when i know there's a gal flare up that's my go-to is we skip right over like if you have Advil at home, I'm not saying don't take it, don't mix it, you know, with the other NSAIDs, but what I'm going to say is don't sit around in pain until you can get into the office, okay? Take some ibuprofen, okay? Take an appropriate amount. You know, everyone's, the, I'm an 800 guy. Not everybody GI tract tolerates it that well. Take the appropriate amount of uh, ibuprofen for you. I would suggest at least 600 up to 800 so you get that anti-inflammatory property as well as the analgesic, but for me, endomethacin's my go-to. Celebrex, also an NSAID, 
not something I've ever really had a lot of feedback or treatment with my patients for the use of, but it is an option. And I know uh, this one's a very popular bin. I'm sure you've diagnosed or uh, prescribed this. Uh, Colchicine, also known as Colchris. Yep. I think there's one more name. I, of course, I wrote it down. Mitigar. I've you ever heard not Mitigar? heard that, no. Yeah. Probably some weird European uh, version. I don't know. Um, but, and then I also had I had also seen uh, corticosteroids. Well, yeah, I'm going to get to that. That's next. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're jumping ahead I'm there. Sorry. So the reason Colchicine works is it's a pain reliever. I, the reason I bring up Colchicine is because it is very popular, but there are some pretty good side effects that are possible. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and itching in large doses. And I will tell you, I, through my many gout flare-ups, again, pre-medical knowledge or a lot of medical knowledge, I was a victim of the Colchris itching. A PA said, here, take this. And I, of course, I, I didn't know anything about Colchris at the time. And they said, you know, take two, and then you take one an hour. Yep. I was like, okay, well, hold, hold on. And then they said, just keep taking it until the pain goes away or you get sick. Like, that was literally my instruction. No, I, I was like, yeah, okay. Except for the pain never stopped, and I never got sick at first. So I kept taking it and taking it and, and taking it. Until and all of a sudden, my entire body turned into a hive. <laughs> so that is when the massive diarrhea started, by the way. So, <laughs> well, and I, uh, I said, as I'm, I have not been afflicted with gout in the past, but I worked with an ER physician that would get gout frequently. And his rule of thumb was you take culture scenes, you take the two, and then you take the one every hour. And you do that until you damn near shit yourself. And then you figure out you've gotten to the point that you've taken enough culture scene. Yeah, that's a really good rule of thumb <laughs> if your entire body doesn't have a, an allergic reaction. So I'll tell you right now, I think it's a, it, if you like culture scene or you like prescribing it, great. If it's effective for you, please do so. I will tell you, I had very little help with it and I won't ever touch it again <laughs> because I I will prescribe it. But if you try and give it to me, I will be like, no, I tried to use steel wool to take my skin off the last time I used this. You are not giving me this. And I, and I then, prescribe it. I stop with like four pills. Like take the two, take the one in an hour, and then you can take one an hour to that. And that's usually where I stop. I don't get into the do it and take a shit yourself. Well, there needs to be some some levity here. So perhaps – I was in a great amount of pain when I was given this prescription. She said something like that, but that's not what I right. heard. I heard, keep taking it till you're sick. And I was like, okay. And, you know, I've heard other prescribers say that, so I don't think it was me, and I don't think it was me misunderstanding. I'm pretty good at following orders. I'll, I'll tell you right now, though, I did, and holy crap. So that was not a, that was not a good outcome. But see, sick to me is more objective. What do you mean sick? Like, okay, do I feel a little nauseous? Ah, but I'm not really sick. If I tell you, take this until you have diarrhea, that's pretty objective. Yes, that, that is very specific. And it's also cruel <laughs> because you are going to get it. Now, colchicine can be used as a preventative in much smaller doses. But I'll be real honest. I don't normally hear of it prescribed in that manner. That's usually an acute attack. Lastly is the one you try to jump to is uh, steroids. And the literature I read said, oh, this should be your last resort. And honestly, if you have a patient with blood sugar issues, I would agree. But I will tell you right now, again, from inside information, prednisone is amazing when your foot feels like it's about to explode. OK, it is fantastic. And I also that is a tendency to go right to the steroid. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hit you up with this, or we're going to hit you up with some steroids. Now, some patients don't want that. I don't really have a recommendation on what steroid. Like, I think every practitioner has their preference. Yeah. I have a prednisone taper I have found works really effectively, and that's my go-to. But if you work well and you want to do one of the other ones and you want to do injections i'm sure your patient's not going to care because i will tell you right now they are in a ton of pain so please help them i just find that the oral steroids work best and that's the suggestion i have 
What are you going to do for chronic, Tom? What am I going to do? I'm going to go, Ben, I have these patients, and you have a vast amount of knowledge, and you went to a conference with a, with a gal physician. Why don't you tell me what to do? No, I'm kidding. I won't do that. So um, here, no. there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's realistically two types of medication for prevention or long-term care, and there's the meds that block uric acid, and there's the meds that improve uric acid removal. So the ones that block uric acids, and I'm going to try and say this name, all right? I'm going to try and say the actual name of this class of drugs. I'm going to butcher it, and it's going to sound terrible, and all of our new listeners on the Helium Radio Network are going to be like, holy shit, I'm not listening to these guys anymore. They don't know what they're talking about. But it looks, and I'm going to say this, xanthine oxidase inhibitors, or XOIs. Yes, yeah, I think you said, it, said that. I think yeah. so, but... I'm willing to admit there's a possibility I screwed that up. So that's that's what I'm looking at. But those are the ones that the the first one. This is the one we all know. Allopurinol. Yep. That's you're good. That's an XOI. Now this next one is I'm definitely going to butcher this name. Febuzostat, but it's with an X. I think I think it's a zo sound with this. It's F E B U X O S T A T. Also, uh, the brand name is Geloric. <laughs> Which is a whole lot easier to say. Whole lot easier to say. Okay. So allopurinol and uloric don't, you know, they're not without their own problems. So you can get a rash and low H and H with the allopurinols. And with the uloric, you can get rash, nausea, decreased liver function. And this is the one that grabbed my attention. Increased heart related death. That's literally what it says. Increased heart-related death. I'm like, well, that's a hell of a downside <laughs> <laughs> right there. But those, honestly, are going to be just about everyone's go-to, are going to be the allopurinol, 100 a day, and that's where you start. Yep, so 100, uh, 100 milligrams daily, titrate every two to four weeks, up to recommended dose of 450. And then the Euloric or Fibrexostat. Yeah, see, say that three times fast. Uh, I'll just have Kyle edit it so it sounds like I said it three times fast. <laughs> <laughs> that damn sound engineer. Start with 40 milligrams daily, titrate up to 80 milligrams daily on that one. Unless you want them to have heart-related death, then you just double it. But that would effectively treat their gout. Hey, all's fair in love and war. And let me tell you, yes, they may not care. They might be like, you know what? Okay, like, do your do your worst. Wait. The but, second... Uh, before you go on to your next one, since we do have listeners yeah. on Helium Radio, I'm not being, you know, the whole, well, that effectively treated their gout by causing cardiac death. I'm referencing the movie The Green Mile where, you know, they botched the execution and they said, well, that was a successful execution. And he's like, how the hell do you think that's a successful ex execution? Well, he will never kill again. So that's kind of where I was referencing that. I'm not a heartless bastard, I promise. Delacroix is dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, yes. So here, here's, I mean, I guess we can edit back in at the beginning and we can do a little thing. But honestly, if you're listening to this show, we're trying to be educational and funny. Yeah. So there's going to be sarcasm. Nothing we have ever said has ever been meant in any harmful way. Even the stuff I say about ugh, Oklahoma, <laughs> none of that is meant to be truly bad. Maybe Arkansas. No, not Arkansas. But nothing bad is ever going to come out of our mouth. We're truly here to try and make our profession, ourselves, and those around us better. So I promise you, we're always in jest. But Ben's not wrong. If they're dead, they're not going to be complaining about gout pain. The last thing, major drugs we need to worry about, and I'm sure somebody's going to write us in like, oh, did you know if you pour lemon juice on their foot? Like, I don't know, some weird shit like that, but... The, the last one that the majority of us are going to use are the medications that help with removal of uric acid. I'll be real honest. I don't know a lot about these. I've never prescribed these, and I pretty much had to do research on them just to figure out what they were. So, Ben, if I say some meds that you've used, I want you to okay. tell me. Okay. So, probenicid. I uh, don't recall using it off the top of my head. And lacinard. I think I'm saying that. Uh, I know but by, by its brand name, which is Zerampic. I have used okay. samples of that with patients. Okay. So let's talk about that last one. That medication 
apparently is helpful, but you can only use that when you they are also taking a, a, a yes. XOI. Okay. Yes. So here are some of the side effects. Side effects. Jesus. Words Christ. are hard. Words are hard. So these are some of the side effects of the medications we were just talking about. Rash, stomach pain, and kidney stones. So coming back full circle, yeah, you got rid of the gout, but I gave you a kidney stone. And let me tell you, they're not going to be much more pleasant with you when you give them a kidney probably stone. Not. So probably not. Kidney stones, not pleasant. That's a whole new episode we're going to have to do. So Ben, I think we, I mean, I feel like we covered the majority of it. Like we covered the stages, we covered diagnosis, we covered risk factors, gout self-care, acute treatment, prevention. What else? What else did we miss? Like I, I again, and I know I said at the beginning, but I can't impress upon you as a person that had multiple flare ups because the first practitioner missed it. And I'm not one of those that's going to say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Mistakes happen. And I completely get that. But what I would illustrate is that due to the fact that he missed it, that roughly two years, Ben, would you say two years? I suffered multiple flare ups because I kept thinking, yeah. boy, I mean, I did have a physical job. I was a police officer at that time. I did have a physical job. We got into fights. We chased people. So when I came home and my foot would hurt, it wasn't impossible that I had twisted it. You know, there, in my head, I kept going, wow, I, I don't remember tweaking it when we arrested that guy, but, you know, maybe I did. And then you find out it's gout. <laughs> That's... There was one other medication, and because you knew it was going to happen eventually, this company combined the Zerampic and Allopurinol together. So, you know, you had to take them together anyway. That medication is called Duzalo. So that is also out there, but it's the combination of the two that you have to take together anyway. So like I said, you figured that had to come eventually because... Well, and honestly, that's yeah. smart. And if your patient, honestly, just from a prescription recommendation part, unless your patient can't take an XOI, I would really hesitate to use that second class of drugs even to start with, unless they've maxed out their XOI or they're unable to well if they can't take an xy they can't take the second class so what i'm I, what i guess what i'm saying is they're not they're not getting effect with the xy that's the only time i would really suggest you even consider moving on to that second yeah, I one agree. with the yeah, combination they're not getting or they're having numerous outbreaks per year because they have a shitty diet and they drink a lot of alcohol and eat shrimp like my co-host not to be Ooh. named Hey, he didn't know he had gout. That's not fair. <laughs> but I, I guess that leads back to something I know we've discussed before, and I don't expect all of our new listeners to have listened to every episode. So let's just say this. So this is for those people out there that are listening that are not in healthcare, or for our new professional healthcare providers, or anyone in between, even the staff nurses. I want you guys to listen to this. We can only treat you as much as you're willing to be treated. And I think Jeff's the one that said, it. I mean, he said it much more eloquently yeah. than that. But if the patient is like, well, you keep putting me on allopurinol and it's not working. And I'm like, OK, so are you working out? And they're like, no. I'm like, are you managing your diet? No. Are you drinking water instead of alcohol or soda? No. Well, then there's there's not I'm, I'm not going to be able to help you. I might be able to manage some of your pain symptoms when you're having acute flare ups, but I'm not going to be able to manage your right. condition. Because I will tell you, I am on the minimum dose of allopurinol, and even then, uh, just avoiding my triggers, I rarely have had flare-ups. I've had a couple, but it's been over years, and most of them have been pretty mild. I will tell you another thing that you can recommend to your patients, I directly applied to the inflammation site, helps immensely. But that's also one of the telltales I will tell you if you are worried about, oh, did I jam my toe or is this gout? I will tell you, you can dunk your foot in ice water, and when you pull it out, it is like still dripping. It will still be hot to the touch. That is a gout flare-up. So, words from Tom. Little little heads up there. Yeah, words from Tom. So those are the things, but it's it is also important to impress upon the patient. This sucks. If you want it to unsuck, then you're going to have to do some work. And on that note, Tom, I mean, I think we covered gout pretty well. I do want to give a shout out to the speaker that I heard at the conference 
the recovered gout, and it was Dr. Tay, who's a rheumatologist. So appreciate all the information I got from from his presentation. So some of the other places I used the the old almighty internet to help me find some of my resources. Now, again, I believe in reputable sources, so I wouldn't just say Google our gout and the first thing you see, you know, use that. But there's arthritis.org had a lot of uh, good information, but again, it's not exactly peer reviewed. So take that with a grain of salt, or at least I can't find any peer review on it. Uh, The Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, up to date, lots of really good reference sites for giving you some good information. And all of them, were very similar, but each one of them would have some kind of new nugget of information. So I do highly suggest if you're going to look up something like this, use multiple sites. You're going to learn a little bit every time the deeper you dive. And if you have any ideas on show ideas that you want us to do, if you want to tell us about your gout experience or treating your patients with gout, or if you're not in healthcare and you are a gout person, hey, sorry for you, man, or woman. Gout person. (laughs) You're afflicted. Do you or someone you know have got the arthritis? Um, reach out to us on our social media. Join the conversation. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all at Dress Some Podcast. Website, www.dressonpodcast.com. Email, admin at dressonpodcast.com. If you're from Ireland and you're really mad at Ben this time for referencing your country and connecting it with this horrible condition called that one gout. in 20 over there have tom one in 20. That, yeah same as here but you said it was because of well you referenced them now they're going to be associated with gout <laughs> i'm just saying for once it's nice to not be the one with my foot in my mouth i'll, I'll take it all right fine. <laughs> so i'm really glad we did this episode and like i said it's super painful like it again i i know i talked about the beginning it just it's one of those things like it was all ha ha until i got it (laughs) and then i will tell you not funny (laughs) not funny at all humor real damn quick didn't it yes yes more more than i can possibly say on on the air but i know tom you and i've talked over the last few weeks i think we've got a lot of amazing shows coming up well i think any show with us is amazing well that's true But, I mean, they're going to be even more amazing. We're just setting the bar higher and higher and higher. I know that there are people reaching out to us saying, hey, cover this. Hey, talk about this. Hey, let us come on the show. We'll talk about this. So I know that we're wanting to do, what, I think more, some workplace issues we got coming coming up. Education. We're going to hammer education through ADN, BSN, MSN, DNP. I had a listener say, hey, you know what, you guys need to talk about like therapeutic communication and nonverbal sign the symptoms or, or nonverbal communication that you need to watch with patients and like family members when you're talking to them. So, I mean, that, that was a great idea also. So, I mean, there are just tons of ideas coming in. If you have an idea, if you want to be on the show, I mean, you know, that's how a lot of our guests have been on the show is come with, come to us with an idea, come to us with an idea. I've actually had, of course, we've had multiple people like, oh, I want to be on your show. And sometimes with stuff we can't talk about on the air. <laughs> I know there's a very popular topic. I don't know how we're going to do a, an episode on it, but a lot of females really want to talk about one topic in particular. But I actually had a nurse practitioner come up to me and she was like, hey, I'm specialized in this type of therapy. When are you going to have me on the show so I could talk about it? And I said, well, maybe we can fit it in. So I'm really excited about the response. And that was my first time somebody came up to me and said that, like in person. They're like, hey, when are we going to do this? I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know you listened to the show. So that was that was pretty fantastic. And that one topic that you're talking about, you know, was it Kathy and Michelle, I believe. I could be wrong on the names. That would be correct. Uh, as I've said, I think we need to hold that episode off until we get video capability of the podcast. <laughs> For our YouTube channel. Yeah, that works too. So, I mean, there's tons of topics coming up, so don't think that we're petering out a topic anytime soon. We are just going to keep bringing you the heat every time. We will talk about anything, right, Tom? Yeah. The moon landings, flat earth, we'll tackle it all. Vaccinations. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, I can't. That's one of those ones we keep just keeping it there like, Yes. One day the dam is going to break and we're just going to get on and it's it's going to be double live a Budokai, man. We're going to be going off on that episode. Here was my thought on this, Tom, and uh, we'll wrap the show up with this. 
I think with the vaccination episode, if and when we get to that, I don't say if, when we get to that, I think let's do it debate style. Let's, I'll let you take the pro-vaccination standpoint, because I assume that's what you would want to take. I am willing for you and for our loyal listeners to jump down that rabbit hole and try to become an anti-vaxxer for a day and debate you scientifically. What do you think? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I got to, do you want me to hold this argument or do you want me to give you a taste of just, what I'm going to reply with? taste and then we'll uh, end the show with that. Okay. Well, uh, children choke every day on food, so maybe we should stop giving them that. <laughs> Look at that taste. That was great. That was a little morsel. A little morsel. <laughs> to come. That's so the punch think- in the face you're going to get every time. <laughs> so if you think that that would be a great way to do our vaccine episode, let us know. Comment on our social media. Let us know if you think that's a great idea, if you think that's a stupid idea. I mean, who's going to be an anti-vaxxer? Clearly there's people out there. I mean, hell, we have measles outbreaks and shit going on right now, so... World epidemic. 10-4. On that note, hey, we got some great episodes coming up. Hope you continue listening. For our Helium Radio Network listeners, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you. And everybody else that's listening on your podcast device, we appreciate you too for being here from the beginning. And we'll go from there, man. Hope everybody has a great week. Everybody stay safe out there.